Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to AMC Mailbag, the Mailbag Show here on AMC Movie Talk, where all we do is take your mailbag questions. Now, as you know, on AMC Movie Talk, Monday through Friday, we take a couple of questions from the mailbag, but here on the weekends, all we do is just take your mailbag questions. I'm going to let you know, for future reference for upcoming AMC Movie Talk shows or AMC Mailbag, you can get your question on the show as well by, what's going on here? By sending your question to us at amcmovietalk at gmail.com. That's where you can email us for the mailbag, so you can send your questions to us there, and we look forward to getting your question, and maybe it'll get on the show. And uh, it is the weekend... Before Comic-Con, this is more than the Oscars. Comic-Con time is the busiest time of the year for people like me and what we do. And and the whole AMC Movie Talk crew has just been running around ragged, uh, trying to get everything ready and all the things we need to do in place. We got a lot of really special and cool things planned for Comic-Con. We're going to have a good time, but we're also going to be producing videos from down at Comic-Con every single day. So keep checking back to our AMC Movie Talk channel. Um, which is, of course, youtube.com slash AMC, uh, AMC Theaters. So you can make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel to stay up to date on everything going on with us at Comic-Con. We're going to have some special guests. We're going to be doing movie talk every day from San Diego. It's going to be a lot of fun, and I'm excited about it. But listen, i got to let you guys know up front, uh, this being said, I almost didn't get today's show in. There will not be a mailbag tomorrow on Sunday. We are just too slammed. We've got way too much going on trying to get ready to leave for Comic-Con. So there will not be an AMC mailbag tomorrow. But, uh, you know, to make sure, you know, we try to at least have one this weekend. So that's why I'm doing uh, the show today to make sure we stay up. And, uh, yeah, I just wanted to give you guys a heads up on that. Speaking of Comic-Con, if any of you are going to be in San Diego or at Comic-Con itself, want to remind you of a couple things. We do have, for people who are in San Diego, but you're not going to Comic-Con, you don't have a Comic-Con pass, we are having an AMC meet and greet um, at the Omni Hotel at the, uh, uh, I can't remember the name of the bar, but it's on the main floor of the Omni Hotel, Schmucks and something, uh, or Shemex or something like that. It's the bar on the first floor of the Omni Hotel. And we're going to be hanging out there from about 6 to 7.30, I think, on Friday night from about 6 to 7.30 um, in that bar and just in the waiting area outside that bar. We're just going to be hanging out there. And if you're in San Diego, you want to come down and say hi to me and the crew, that's where we're going to be. So uh, that'll be great. If you are going to Comic-Con, don't forget our annual Masters of the Web panel is going on Thursday at 11.30 in the morning in room 24ABC. Uh, so that's where we're going to be. And of course, our special guest this year is Deathstroke himself from Arrow, Crixus from Spartacus, and of course, Azog, the white orc in uh, the Hobbit films, uh, Mr. Manu Bennett. And we're really excited Manu's going to be there. And joining me on the panel this year... Other AMC movie talkers, we got Christian Harloff and, of course, John Schnepp. But then we've also got Mark Ellis from Schmoes No. We have the wonderful Tiffany Smith from Fandango and DC All Access. And, of course, the one and the only Mr. Jeremy Johns is going to be joining us on the panel as well. And our special theme this year is comic book movies. Uh, last year was horror. This year, it's comic book movies. We're really excited. Make sure you join us. But we're also going to be on the Comic-Con floor uh, Thursday from 1 p.m. to, I think, 3 p.m. We're going to be uh, taking pictures and signing autographs at John Schnepp's booth uh, on the Comic-Con floor and on Saturday as well. So a lot of stuff going on with us at Comic-Con. Make sure you come down and say hi at some point. That'll be great to see you. All right. Well, now, before we get into the questions today, um, I should probably bring this up. Last night, I got to go see Guardians of the Galaxy at uh, the Disney lot. I went to go to I went to Disney Studios last night and watched Guardians of the Galaxy. Uh, me and about 200 other journalists went to go watch it last night. Apparently, we're the first audience to see it in North America. At least that's what they said. I don't know if they're telling us the truth or not. Um, and I, I got to tell you, I'm really happy. I'm really, really happy. And judging by the Twitter response that went out last night from all 200 of those people, everybody seems pretty damn happy uh, with Guardians of the Galaxy. It is fun. Well, this is exactly what I said on my Twitter feed. It's fun. It's funny. It's got an epic scale. And it's just, it exceeded my expectations. I, it really did. It's, it's wonderful. It's really, really good. And I can't wait to do our spoiler review of it. I'm going to go see it again this Monday night. I'm going to be down at the world premiere. I'm going to watch it for a second time. Can't wait to watch it again. Uh, everybody is just blowing up Twitter right now from who's seen it and going crazy about it. Now, I've got a lot of people online, though, asking me, how does it compare to Captain America 2? Because that kind of seems to be the new flag bearer. Captain America 2 seems to be the new standard for standalone uh, Marvel films. Um, 
And I, I think it probably is the best standalone Marvel film. For me, it used to be Thor uh, and, and the original Iron Man, but Captain America 2 is, is now the standard bearer for me uh, and the bar for what a great Marvel solo film is. So a lot of people were asking me on Twitter and on Facebook last night after I tweeted out that I really loved uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. People asked me, all right, but is it better than Captain America 2? I hesitate to say this, but I need to. No. I don't think it's quite as good as Captain America 2. But keep in mind, Captain America 2 is a super high, in my opinion anyway, so you got to remember, this is my opinion. Captain America 2 is a super high standard of a movie. It is unbelievable. So to say, hey, I don't think it's quite as good as Captain America 2 is not a knock on Guardians of the Galaxy. You all know how much I love the original Thor movie. I don't think the original Thor movie is quite as good as Captain America 2. You all know how much I love the original Iron Man movie. But I don't think it's quite as good as the original Captain, or as good as Captain America 2. Um, so for me to say that I don't think Guardians of the Galaxy is quite as good as Captain America 2, that is not a slam at all. That is not a knock on it at all. This is a fun, entertaining movie that I think everybody is going to enjoy. Uh, it's just super entertainment. I think you're going to like it. But to answer that question, I don't think it's quite as good as Captain America 2. But keep in mind that they are two very, very different movies. Um... So I don't want to get, I don't want to do a review right now. We're going to save our review for the spoilers review in a couple of weeks when Guardians of the Galaxy opens up. Um, I'm really excited because tomorrow I, um, I'm going to go and do the press junket actually for Guardians of the Galaxy. So I'm going to get to sit down and talk with Chris Pratt. Uh, I'm going to sit down with Dave Bautista, uh, James Gunn, Zoe Saldana, um, Kevin Feige. I can't, I can't, I don't know. I don't think Bradley Cooper is going to be there. Maybe he will be. I'm not sure. But anyway, I'll have to look up the list. So I'm going to be meeting with all those guys. I'm going to share those interviews with you in the coming days as well. Um, so yeah, keep your eye open for all that stuff. Okay. So that's the Guardians of the Galaxy things. Now let's move on to the movie questions today. I got 10 questions picked out. So let's get on with it. Let's go to question number one. And question number one today comes, comes from Tony Kamara, who writes, a uh, AMC Movie News crew, I was wondering what your thoughts on general critics and the average movie viewer. There are certain movies when I watch, I go into the movie thinking I want to be entertained and have fun watching it like popcorn movie. I guess what I'm getting at is that it bothers me that sometimes people critique certain movies for their plot, acting, or whatever. It's realistic or not. When watching, uh, for example, any Expendables or Fast and the Furious, I mean, when I go see movies, I'm expecting great action and funny one-liners. I'm not analyzing the same way I would The Godfather, Shawshank Redemption, Argo, etc., I mean, as a viewer, should you know what kind of movie it is and judge accordingly, right? Uh, well, thanks a lot for the question, Tony. Um, and this is actually kind of a big issue that, that I hear from people a lot. Um, you know, I, I'll tell you right now, I am not a film critic. Do I review movies? Yes, but I wouldn't count myself as a film critic. I mean, to me, a, a true film critic is somebody with a journalism degree, a film history degree, whatever. I count them as true critics. There are other, other people out there like me who are film reviewers. We review film. But so are you. You are a film critic. You, I mean, you are a film reviewer. The moment you say somebody, I like that movie, you are being, you are reviewing a film. The minute you get on Twitter and say, I didn't like this movie, you are reviewing a film. And um, I wouldn't say you're a film critic, but you are reviewing a film. And, and that's kind of the same with me. As I adjust my camera here a bit. Um, I am, I am not a film critic. I'm more of a film reviewer. So whatever. But here's the thing, though. There is this illusion going around that, you know, film critics and film viewers are on totally different pages. And that's simply not true. Because what happens is that when people try to make that argument that film critics are out of touch with film viewers, what they do is, is they pull out the two or three examples out of every hundred movies. You know, 90 to 95% of the time, generally speaking, the critics and the viewers are on the same page. And every once in a while, you'll get a movie where the critics and the, and the viewers are on different pages. But that's simple math. I mean, that's odds. The odds are, look, you roll a 20-sided dice, the odds of you rolling a one are very small. But if you keep rolling that dice, eventually you're going to hit one. You're going to hit, and then eventually you'll hit one again. You know, critics and, and film viewers are generally on the same page most of the time. But Odds are the more and more movies come out every once in a while, you're going to get a film where generally speaking critics and generally speaking, the, the wider movie viewing audience are going to be on different pages. Nothing wrong with that. That's okay. That's cool. 
But there is a solution going around that, you know, critics don't like the fun movies. Critics don't like the successful movies. Critics don't like the exciting movies. I remember back in 2010, 2011, I can't remember, but that first G.I. Joe film came out. And you know, I'll admit, I did not hate Stephen Summers' G.I. Joe film. I didn't hate it. I thought I was going to hate it. I didn't hate it. I didn't particularly like it much, but I didn't hate it. It was better than I thought it was going to be. Anyway, Stephen Summers, uh, but a lot of the critics disliked it uh, quite a bit, and I can totally see why the critics disliked it. And what Stephen Summers did at the time, and I got no problem with Stephen Summers, just so you know, I just took issue with this statement. And, and it's okay to have issue with something somebody does or something somebody says without having an issue with them personally. Um, and I got no problems with Stephen Summers personally, but I did take issue with this statement he made this one time. He was getting hammered by critics. And what Stephen Summers said, he made this statement in an interview with Variety magazine. And he said, you know, critics are out of touch. And this is what he said. He said, critics don't like the popular or financially successful movies. They're a dying breed. You know, he was just really butthurt that people didn't like his movie. And so he turned the guns on the critics and attacked them. You know, they're just, they were just doing their job, reviewing the movie. Um, so anyway, he really turned on them and said, critics don't like popular films. They don't like financially successful films. They don't like the fun films. They're just always going to say bad things about them. So that was his defense. And that's kind of like the prevailing myth going around that critics don't like the big successful movies. They only like artsy films about young men coming out of their out of the closet to their alcoholic father who just got back from World War II and is fighting a sexually transmitted disease that he got from an Asian prostitute who was abandoned by her mother at a young age and raised by lions. That's an Oscar winner that I Somebody write that down. Somebody take a note of the movie I just described. That's your Oscar winner next year. Anyway, so there's this prevailing theory that's complete myth that that's the only kind of films critics like, right? So back in 2011, um, I responded, I made a video response to Stephen Summers' uh, uh, statements that I'm sure he watched many times. Stephen Summers doesn't even know who I am. Uh, anyway, so, <laughs> so why would he care? But I made this video response. And in it, one of the things I pointed out is like, really? Really? So critics don't like popular films and they don't like the exciting films. They don't like the fun films. And I was like, okay, that's interesting. Well, obviously then, the critics didn't like X-Men, like the first X-Men film. They had a comic book film with a guy with claws coming out of his hands and magnetic powers. Surely the critics, according to Stephen Summers, the critics must have hated that, right? Turns out the first X-Men movie has an 80% critic rating on Rotten Tomatoes. 80%. Well, well, according to Stephen Summers, obviously, and if critics don't like the popular and, and fun movies and whatever, surely the critics didn't like The Dark Knight, Christopher Nolan's Dark Knight, right? Because Batman, listen to the name, Batman, a dude who puts on a mask and runs around with his expensive toys. I'm fighting crime with a guy called the Joker. Come on, give me a break. Clearly, the critics wouldn't have liked that, right? Oh, wait, the critics gave Dark Knight a 94%. Well, yeah, but critics don't like just the fun popcorn movies, the summer kind of movies. They don't like the Avengers, 92%. Last time I checked, I haven't checked in a while. Maybe it's up one or two, maybe it's down one or two. But last time I checked, 92% the critics gave the Avengers. The epitome of the fun, popcorn, exciting, you know, just uh, crowd-pleasing, popular movie. Um, well, surely they didn't like Captain America 2. High 80%. Surely they didn't like Spider-Man 2. I'm going to shoot webs out of my hands. The so critics would hate that crap, right? Oh, like 90% critic rating on Rotten Tomatoes. Oh, sure. Well, they don't, wouldn't go for those really sweaty, geeky movies like those Lord of the Rings films, right? 92, 94, 96%, respectively. Um, so what I said in my video is, Stephen Summers, tell me again how critics don't like popular, fun movies. T tell me again how movies that lots of that, like the general population likes, we don't like. Oh, they wouldn't like genre films. They wouldn't like fun films. They, they don't like these types of films. Um, actually they do when they're good, when they're good, the critics will eat them up, uh, for the most part. Yeah. Obviously I'm somebody who I love, uh, Man of Steel. 
But the critics only gave it 50%. That means half the critics liked it, but half of them didn't. So I disagree with the critics on that one, clearly. I, I liked it a lot more. But so you're going to get, you're going to get, you know, um, some, some discrepancies in there every once in a while. It's totally normal. But to make a blanket statement like, oh, the critics just don't like popular movies. I'm sorry. But the facts say otherwise. Pull up the history of the good, fun, exciting, even nay, dare I say it, the popcorn films, pull them up and see what the critics thought of them. And when they're good movies, they give them really high scores. I just listed off a whole ton of them. You know, this year alone, X-Men Days of Future Past, Captain America. I'm going to tell you right now, this Guardians of the Galaxy film is going to get huge critic rating. It's going to get a huge, I'm guessing mid to high 80s, maybe even the low 90s. It's going to get a huge critic rating. Um, so you get these fun, popular, whatever movies, and the critics do like them when they're good. All right? But here's the thing that, that you're pointing out in your question, Tony, is... I got to tell you, I got a little bit of a bone to pick with people, with two groups of people, right? There is the really pompous, um, ignorant, you know, kind of film critic point of view um, that is like, well, you know, if, uh, and this, there aren't many of these people, but they, there are film critics like this. If uh, your story wasn't based on a 17th century uh, text, then it doesn't carry the sophistication to be good and blah, blah, blah. I, I hate those types of people. But the other thing I hate equally as much is people who defend bad movies. And it's all subjective. It's all subjective. But people who defend bad movies, and I'm not mad that they defend them. I'm mad how they defend them by just pointing a finger at the people who saying there aren't good movies and saying the problem's with you. You're the problem. Like, if you didn't like Transformers 4, big pile of garbage movie, but I, I'm cool with people say, hey, I really like Transformers 4. Cool, I'd be curious to know what you liked about it because I saw nothing but a big, hot, seeming pile of mess. But if that's your opinion, cool, that's fine. But what drives me crazy is when I see people respond to other film critics and saying, oh, you just didn't like it because you don't like fun movies. Really? That that dude gave Avengers an A plus on his review. Tell me how he doesn't like fun movies. Oh, you just didn't like it because you just, you're out of touch. Really? Because if you look that dude up on Rotten Tomatoes, like his film line up with the, the popular opinion is about 82% of the time. Oh, you just didn't like Transformers because of this. What, what drives me crazy, what is actually more pompous than the stuck up film critic, what is even more pompous than that is when people like me or you or, or, or any a bunch of our friends or whatever, when we try to defend um, a certain movie, by attacking the person who says they don't like it. To me, that's the most pompous thing you can do. I mean, look, I, I, we fun, we tease, we, we say, you're insane if you don't like that. That's all cool. We all understand the film's subjective and we're just jiving, we're having a good time, we're using our burbly, whatever. But, but man, when, like, like I say, I didn't like Transformers 4 and everybody knows I am biased to like Transformers 4. I'm one of the only people in the world who adamantly defends the first one. I was one of the only people in the world and online to vehemently defend the choice of Michael Bay as the director. Everybody was crapping on Bay as the director, except me. When they announced Michael Bay as the director, I started making videos and podcasts about he was the right guy for this because of the certain style, right? I thought his style will match well with the Transformers. And I love the first Transformers films, but I've been let down ever since despite my bias to liking them. Um, I haven't been able to enjoy them since, and I thought Transformers 4 was terrible. And I've read a lot of people on my various social media channels that like the movie, and they explain why they like it, and that's cool. That's, that's the best thing about movies. It's all subjective. We all have different points of view. What drives me crazy, though, is when I see some people who hate the movie say, well, if you like Transformers, then clearly you have no intellect and you have no appreciation for what a good movie is and blah, 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 blah. That's that's terrible. But equally as terrible is the other side of people saying, well, if you didn't like Transformers, you just don't appreciate fun movies. You don't know how to appreciate just a good fun movie. No, it's just that maybe your definition of fun in mine is a little bit different. Because I watch Avengers... It has action, funny one-liners, all that kind of stuff. But it had a story that worked and characters that were likable and all, and it all came together and they crafted it into a package that was a full entertainment value. And it was great. Transformers 4 was a, just a dirty hot mess. You know, I put on Twitter the other day and I'm going, I know I'm ranting on this for a while, but I put up on Twitter the other day. I said, you know, action without narrative or purpose is just visual diarrhea. Action without narrative or purpose is just visual diarrhea. 
And that's what I felt like me personally. And I know a lot of people like Transformers. That's great. I'm just, I'm just explaining why I didn't. Uh, Transformers 4 to me was just a lot of purposeless action. It's like, wait a minute, remind me again. Why are they having this fight now? Where did the samurai robot come from? Explain to me why the Dinobots are joining in this fight. Um, tell me why now Optimus Prime, whenever he gets startled, he starts yelling, I'll kill you, I'll kill you, I'll kill you. Um, so why is Megatron now suddenly a Scooby-Doo villain going, and this is what he said, saying, no, the Autobots are ruining everything. Explain to me why that's happening. Really? Uh, to me, it was horrible, but I accept that there are other people who liked it, and I encourage you to like it if you do, and that's great. So my whole point here, Tony, is that I think you can have the idea of having a good, fun popcorn film and the idea of having a good film are not mutually exclusive terms. Make an Avengers. That is a, make a Wreck-It Ralph. Make a kick-ass. That is a good example of just a fun, goofy, funny, but kind of exciting, you know, film, but also make it a good film. And then you got something really good when you got something really special. But then when you come to Transformers 4 and you just put verbal or visual diarrhea um, up on the screen and say, now people will like it. Now there's a lot of people who won't. And trust me, these critics who like and give 90% ratings to Dark Knight and Avengers and Spider-Man 2 and X-Men and Captain America Winter Soldier and, you know, all these other films, Pacific Rim and all, all these, these are the same critics. They like all those films. So maybe when they say they don't like Transformers 4, maybe the problem isn't them. Maybe they're not the problem. Maybe the problem is they didn't do a very good job of marrying fun and exciting with good story, good characters, whatever, and make one cohesive movie. They didn't do a good job. Now, that doesn't mean nobody should like it. It, it will still appeal to some people. Look, I like Armageddon. I'm going to acknowledge to you, it's probably a pretty bad movie, but for whatever reason, it works for me. And I don't feel like I have to be embarrassed about that opinion. And I don't feel like I have to defend that opinion. And nor should you. If you're a fan of Transformers 4, you're going to have, you're going to have to accept that there are people like me who have some pretty good reasons for not liking Transformers 4. And that these same people who don't like Transformers 4 do indeed like a lot of those big summer blockbuster films. But you don't have to be embarrassed that you like Transformers 4, nor should you feel the need to defend it. So anyway, that's kind of my approach to this whole thing and, and, and why they're different. Like, don't instantly think if a critic doesn't like a movie that they're the problem. Maybe the problem is the movie. And because of that, it didn't appeal to them, but that the movie does enough right that it was tailored to you. And that's okay. That's a good way to approach it. All right. I spent way too much time on that topic. Anyway, let's move on to question number two. And the question number two comes to us today from Jonathan Gray. And Jonathan Gray writes, Hey, Movie Talk crew. I only stumbled upon your show about a month ago, but I've been instantly hooked. Well, thanks a lot, Jonathan, and welcome to the Sons of AMC. My question is with George R.R. R. Martin publicly stating that he'd like to see his A Song and Fire and Ice series end in a movie. Uh, what studio would like to see get the rights, and who do you think would make the best director for the challenging job? Thanks, and bring on the filthy. Well, uh, thanks a lot there for the question, Jonathan. Now, if I'm not mistaken, uh, let me look this up here quick. Um, let's see. Time Warner HBO. If I'm not mistaken, I believe Time, I believe Warner owns HBO. If I'm not mistaken, I, I could be wrong about that. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong about that. But I believe HBO might be actually be owned by Warner Brothers. So if um, we do see a movie version of George R. R. Martin's um, stuff, it, it is, it's most likely that it would probably then go to Warner Brothers. Uh, that's where it would probably go. If they were going to do a Game of Thrones movie, it would probably go to Warner Brothers. But like I said, I could be wrong about that. You have to correct me if I'm wrong in the... In the uh, comment section below. But there are two points I want to make here regarding your question. Number one, uh, George R.R. R. Martin says he would like it to end in a movie. Well, you do know that that's irrelevant. Whatever George R.R. R. Martin wants or thinks is completely irrelevant. The studios do not care what George R.R. R. Martin wants or thinks. And, and George R.R. R. Martin isn't some pompous jerk who thinks, because I think this, they should do it. No, no. Martin just said he'd like to see that. 
That's what he'd like to see. But he's not some pompous, arrogant jerk who's, who'd go around, well, since I think you should do it, you should do it. And the studios, they don't care. They're, they're going to do what they think makes sense. Now, I'm going to give you my opinion on this, and it's going to be unpopular, but there, I'm not afraid to say what's unpopular. So here's the thing with Game of Thrones. Now, I've always said that like a prequel to Game of Thrones might be interesting, like how, you know, in the hundred or some odd years, whatever, leading up to the events of the beginning of Game of Thrones, I've always thought that might be interesting. Back in that age of dragons from before, that might be interesting. But I'm going to tell you right now, as the as the show stands right now, I don't think you can do a Game of Thrones movie, and I don't think I want a Game of Thrones movie, and here's why. I like Game of Thrones, and I watch it every week. When it's on, I watch it. Uh, when I start to miss them, I binge watch them on my Roku and then get cut off to the current season. And then I start watching them on HBO Go. So I, I watch a show weekly. I like it. I like Game of Thrones. But I, as, a, as somebody who likes a show, I do have one big glaring flaw with the show, in my opinion. Just my opinion. And that is the show is very, very, very slow. It is a very slow show. And that has its benefits. Being that slow has its benefits. But what's frustrating to me is that there are so many characters that when I have a couple of favorites, like like many people, one of my favorites is Tyrion Lannister, right? Obviously. So when when I have like a favorite and I get attached to a favorite and then I watch Game of Thrones, I'm going to be lucky if I get five minutes of Tyrion. I'm lucky if I get five minutes of Tyrion Lannister. If, you know, one of my favorite characters... I don't know, uh, was was Joffrey. Everybody hated Joffrey. But if, if he was one of my characters, you're lucky if you're going to get five minutes of him in an episode. You know, if you're a fan of True Detective, you're going to get a good solid 40 minutes of Matthew McConaughey. You're going to get a good 40 to 45 minutes of, of the main star, of your favorite characters. You are going to get 40 to 45 minutes of them in that show. If you watch a half hour show of Friends back in the day, you're guaranteed to at least get 10 good minutes, maybe 12 minutes of uh, Courtney Cox or David Schwimmer or Jennifer Aniston. You're going to get them. But Game of Thrones is like, you're going to be lucky if you get five minutes of your favorite guy because they got so much going on. It jumps all over the place. Now, the reason I mention all that um, is because in my opinion, that you can't make a movie like that. And if you do make a movie and you try to squeeze in a season's worth of story into one two-hour movie, it's not going to feel like Game of Thrones anymore. I mean, you're certainly going to have to cut out three-quarters of the characters, or at least just give three-quarters of the characters five-minute cameos and focus the movie on three or four characters and one storyline. And that's not what Game of Thrones is. Game of Thrones always has like seven different storylines going, all in different parts of, of their world, with different characters embarked on each. Sometimes they mildly tie into each other, but for the most part, there are a lot of different separate stories running. You can't do a movie that way. I mean, there have done movies that way, but I mean, even... But if you're going to do a Game of Thrones movie, what you would have to do is pick the three characters you're really going to focus on. It would probably be the Lannisters, at least the ones that are left alive. Um, would probably be in whatever main story arc they're a part of. And you're going to follow them. And then all these other characters will probably have to be, play small parts throughout. And I don't think that would make Game of Thrones fa fans happy. So I don't think they should do one. And I don't think they really could and do it right and do it in such a way that would make people happy. So keep it where it is on TV. Just my opinion. But uh, I, I just think it would be a Game of Thrones movie becomes very problematic. All right, let's move on to the next question today. And the next question today comes to us from Bill Crispy, who writes, Hi, AMC crew. Your show rocks every single day, and I'm grateful to see you every day. Well, thank you so much, Bill. We're grateful that you watch. My question for today is the thing that John mentioned earlier this year that he thinks if episode seven is a great movie, then maybe episode eight could be the most successful movie of all time. What does that mean for the Avengers sequel? Do you think Age of Ultron has the chance to be even more successful than the beloved first Avengers movie? Great question, Bill. Yeah, what I said before, somebody asked me before, hey, do you think Star Wars Episode Seven could become the highest bo grossing box office movie of all time? And I said, while it's certainly possible, and I wouldn't discount the possibility, I think it's unlikely at this point. But what I said was, because remember, we're coming off of those poor, crappy pieces of human garbage uh, prequel films. 
So they've got to recapture the confidence and imagination of the audience. And all it's Star Wars, so we're all going to go give it a shot. But what I said then was that, but if Episode 7 knocks it out of the park and reestablishes the greatness of Star Wars, then Episode 8, I think, becomes a strong contender to become the biggest box office film of all time. Because it's Star Wars and it's coming off a successful film. Success in terms of quality, did, did audiences love it? Did critics love it? Did it make money? All those things. So when I say success, I don't just mean one of those elements. I mean all of them. If episode seven is a real success, then episode eight, I think, becomes very positioned to become a really huge hit. So what Bill is asking, very interesting question. What does that mean for Avengers 2? I'm telling you, I'm, I'm dying to know. I'm dying to know because everything we're hearing and seeing out of Avengers 2 right now looks fantastic. Looks really fun. Whedon is back on the job. The first Avengers, my opinion, greatest comic book movie of all time. Uh, people kept going again and again and again and again. Just unbelievable. Biggest box office success in the genre's history. Uh, just incredible. So now you got Avengers 2 coming that gets to build on that first film success. If Avengers 2 is not better than the first Avengers, but if it's just as good as the first Avengers, even 95% as good as the first Avengers, I believe Avengers 2 will have a shot. I'm not going to call it, but I'll say it has a shot at, um, at actually becoming the, the biggest box office film of all time. I believe that. So we'll see. Now, there are some other movies coming that also have that potential. Like I said, I, I wouldn't write off Star Wars Episode 7 as no chance. I just think very, very little for now. Uh, Batman versus Superman, I still think has a, a huge potential to be a monster box office hit. If it's good, look, ba I said this before, Batman versus Superman doesn't even need to be great. Just be good. If Batman versus Superman is even just good, I think you're going to see just a monster box office take like bill. It'll, it'll join the $1 billion worldwide club. I believe that. Uh, but as far as this adventures go, let's wait and see, but everything looks good. As long as nothing comes completely off the rails between now and then, like some still from the movie gets leaked out and Jar Jar Binks is in it and everybody gives up on the film. As long as nothing tragic like that happens, I think, uh, Avengers 2 is in really good shape right now. And it's, once again, I wouldn't put money that it'll beat Titanic or Avatar. But I wouldn't bet against it either. It, it's got a very legitimate shot. All right, let's move on to the next question today. And the next question today comes to us from Chris Smith, who writes, Dear AMC Movie Talk, love the show. Best wishes from uh, or best wishes for the Geeky Awards. Well, thank you so much. For those of you who don't know what he's talking about, um, AMC um, Movie Talk, we were just nominated for Best Podcast um, for the Geeky Awards uh, upcoming in the award ceremony on August 17th in, in Hollywood at the Avalon Theater. Um, you can go to the geekyawards.com and buy tickets. If you want to go to that, the tickets are expensive though. I think they're like 150 bucks, but, uh, they are there and you can go to it. Uh, we're excited about it. We're really honored to be nominated this year, uh, for the award. And, um, like I said on my Twitter account, if in the words of Andre, the giant from the princess bride, I hope we win. Okay. Let's go back to the question now. Uh, love the show. Best wishes for the geeky award. Would you say that Emilio Estevez has fallen off the radar? And is there any possibility of him rejuvenating his career like Breakfast Club co-star Molly Ringwald co starring in the upcoming Gem and the Holograms adaptation? Uh, well, for those of you who didn't know, there is an upcoming Gem and the Holograms. Uh, John Chu, the guy who directed uh, G.I. Joe 2, um, left directing G.I. Joe 3 so he could go do a Gem and the Holograms movie. At least that's kind of the word. But he directed it and it's in post-production now. It's coming out. Um... First of all, would I say that Emilio Estevez has fallen off the radar? Well, yeah, in 2001, <laughs> he felt, he's been off the radar forever. Hold on, let me, let me pull up Emilio here. And by the way, I like, uh, um, I like Emilio Estevez, uh, quite a bit. I've, I've always enjoyed his stuff, but really what's the last real thing he did? Um, he made a guest appearance on his brother's show, Two and a Half Men, in 2000, or Two and a Half Men, I mean, in 2008. He was in that spoof movie, The L.A. Riot Spectacular, back in 2005. That's nine years ago. 
He made a special cameo appearance as the young Jed Bartlett because his dad plays Jed Bartlett in the West Wing in 2003. That's 11 years ago. Um, the real last real movie of his was D3. No, that's that was an episode. Yeah, D3, The Mighty Ducks. Uh, and that was in 1996. So that's 18 years ago. So when you ask me, has Emilio Estevez, do I think Emilio Estevez has fallen off the radar? Dude, he's been off the radar for 15 years. He's been gone. Now, I, I know he's uh, he took a shot at doing some writing and directing. He directed, and he might have appeared in that movie, The Way, that he did with his dad, Charlie Sheen, uh, or Martin Sheen, I should say, with his dad. Uh, and that was a pretty well-received thing, but it didn't get any traction. It didn't get any acclaim. It didn't get any success. Uh, he's directed some television episodes like uh, CSI New York, uh, that show Numbers, Cold Case, uh, The Guardian. So he's done a, a little bit of television directing. But for the most part, yeah, dude, he fell off the radar like 15 years ago. And that's unfortunate because I like Emilio Estevez. I think he's he's good. But um, the fact of the matter is he's 52, 53 years old now. Not every actor has a career into the, the their 50s, 60s, and 70s. Not every actor does that. Emilio Estevez had, by all definitions, a successful career. And for the most part, that career is now over. For the most part. Uh, I'm sure he wouldn't say that. But, I mean, hey, it's over. He had a really good run. He had a good career. We all know the name Emilio Estevez. So, clearly, he made an impact and he made his imprint. Um, and he had what a lot of people would be very jealous of and envious of, his career. But I also think the career is pretty much done. Now, the something I got, I'm going to tease you a little bit now, Chris. I'm going to tease you a little bit for, for the question you asked. But then you asked in your, in your thing, do I think that Emilio could rejuvenate his career like Molly Ringwald did by being in Gem and the Holograms? Um, well, I think Molly, for, for the first thing, Molly is in a, is in a TV show right now, uh, or, or, or it might be over by now. I'm not completely sure, but the secret life of the American teenager, I don't know if it's canceled now, if it's still going on, but she's got a regular gig, um, on that. Um, she's done a guest appearance on a TV show now, again, back in the mid two thousands. But, but here's the thing. Appearing in a movie does not mean your career is rejuvenated. All right. Um, Tropic Thunder rejuvenated Tom Cruise's career, but it's not just because he appeared in it. Tom Cruise appears in a lot of movies, but he made a huge impact with his role in Tropic Thunder. Every It was memorable. Everybody loved him in it. All that kind of stuff. That rejuvenated his career and his popularity. Molly Ringwald appearing as one of the side characters. Um, Oh, I, I, I don't know if it's a side character uh, at all. I don't know much about Gem and the Holograms, the movie coming out, but appearing in a movie, Gem and the Holograms, which is going to be terrible. That's just my prediction. My, my prediction is going to be that it's it's going to be terrible. I have no interest in it, and I think it's going to be a big flop. Um, fingers crossed. I hope you know, look, I, I never want to see a movie flop. I want to I want to see every movie be awesome and every movie be successful. I'm just saying I, it looks like it's going to be a flop to me and it looks like it's going to be terrible to me, but let's give it a fair shake when it comes out. But I, I think it's premature to say, Hey, Molly Ringwald's career is rejuvenated because she's in gem and the holograms. I, I'm going to tease you a little bit for that, my, my brother. I'm going to tease you a little bit for that because I don't, I don't think that's the definition of rejuvenating your career. But hey, it's one more movie than I'm in. So give her credit for that. And I want, like, like Emilio Estevez, I like Molly Ringwald. I do. But it, it's another case like Emilio Estevez. Look, Wayne Gretzky, uh, one of the greatest, if not the greatest, hockey player in the history of the universe, he played hockey and at some point his career ended. And I think for the most part, the careers of Molly Ringwald and for the most part, the careers of Emilio Estevez as major movie stars, I believe their career is done. Uh, they can still get gigs here and there. Um, but I think for, for the most part, the career is done. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm repeating myself here. But I mean, Molly Ringwald and Emilio Estevez, the fact that we're talking about them, the fact that we know who they are and we know their names proves that they had successful careers that made their mark and left an impression on us because we can still talk about them today. I can say Molly Ringwald and you'll know who I'm talking about. 
And there's nothing wrong with the fact that at some point the career winds down. Nothing wrong with that. And if they do get rejuvenated by something, that would be great too. I'm just, you know, commenting on the current status of how I see their careers right now. All right, what's next? The next question today comes to us from, if we can get it up here, here it is. Louis Lau writes, Hello, AMC Movie Talk. Uh, you make my daily work so much more entertaining. Well, thank you, Louis. I'm glad we can be of service that way. My question is, are there any plans to make a great and epic police crime thriller similar to the Infernal uh, Affairs trilogy? Unfortunately, no The Departed 2, but anything close to it coming out soon? Um, I, I, I'm not really sure. Like Great police movies, at least what they hope to be great police movies and crime movies, are, are coming out all the time and they always try to make those. But what's really interesting is you bring up the Infernal Affairs series of films. Uh, now, Infernal Affairs, for those who don't know, is the Asian film that is the basis for The Departed. Um, the Departed is actually a remake of Infernal Affairs that uh, won Best Picture of the Oscars, The Departed did, won Best Picture of the Oscars, won Martin Scorsese, his first Director of the Year award. Um, great, fabulous movie. Anyway, it's based on this Asian film, Infernal Affairs, which is a series of films. And they're all great. And one of the things that your question really brings to my mind is that whenever you're talking about franchises, they always seem to be comedies or action. It's when I'm, I didn't research this, so I'm just trying to think of them off the top of my head. Leave some comments in, in the comment section if you can, guys. But what was the last drama franchise? What was the last dramatic franchise? I mean, we didn't get, um, oh, what's the name of the Brad Pitt movie and, uh, Kevin Spacey why, and Morgan Freeman and why am I drawing a blank? I'm, I refuse to look it up. I refuse to look it up. I've got it. Why? I just drew a big brain freeze and I am not going to look this up. I'm going to remember, um, seven. <laughs> yes. Seven. Um, so like why, you know, there's no seven, two out there. There's no, uh, Schindler's list two. There's no, um, you, you know what I mean? It's, I cannot remember the last time we had a real dramatic sequel and had a dr drama based franchise. If you guys can think of any, uh, drop them in the, mention them in the comment section. I think it's a fascinating discussion to have is why don't we see, because drama movies are great. Why not continue those stories? I, I, and so I'm, maybe I'm missing, maybe I'm just forgetting off the top of my head, 15 of them, 15 obvious examples that I'm just completely forgetting about right now. But do me a favor, guys, jump in the comment section and, uh, and mention if you, the last time you thought of like franchises are based on drama as opposed to action or comedy. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. As far as do we hear any more coming out? Well, look, every movie coming out has the potential to be a great epic crime drama thriller. Every crime drama thriller coming out has the potential to be an epic one, but we just don't know until they actually hit. So we're just gonna have to wait around and see, I guess. All right, let's move on to the next question today. And the next question today comes to us from Mark Denny. And Mark Denny writes, I'm a huge Christian Bale fan and own most of his films. I get excited for any movie he's in. I always thought he should do a movie with Guy Ritchie and do a snatch type film or a rock and roller movie. I think it would be interesting because Guy Ritchie's films feature dark comedy and drama, which I think would be a nice role for Bale to tackle. I also think it would be cool to have Bale use his accent, his actual real accent. Uh, what do you guys think? I think it's an awesome idea. Putting Christian Bale in a Guy Rich movie, I'm all for it. Um, the two films in particular, I'm not a big fan of rock and roll. I'm going to admit, I'm not a big fan of rock and roll. But his two films, Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels, awesome. But I believe his best film is Snatch. Um, the directing of Snatch is incredible because the pace of that film is so sick good. So, such a good, good pace to that film. Um, and it's, I just love it. And seeing Christian Bale in a Guy Ritchie movie, playing a Jason Statham kind of role, you know the role that Statham plays in Snatch? You have Christian Bale playing that kind of a role in a Guy Ritchie film? I think you've got some potential for some serious magic, dude. I think that would be awesome. I would love to see Bale start tackling some comedy. Um, I think it would be really cool to see him navigate those waters because I think the perception of him of being so hard and serious will serve him well in doing comedy. Uh, much like the way when Robert De Niro first really started getting into comedy, it wasn't his first attempt at it, but when you looked at films like uh, in, uh, Analyze This, or you looked at films like The First Meet the Parents, that image of Robert De Niro 
actually helped the comedy of Robert De Niro because of his personality type. And I think, I think an actor like Christian Bale could enjoy the same benefits of that. His image, so hard and serious, now put that into comedy and to allow him to play off that, I think it opens a really interesting slew of possibilities, especially if it's in a film, the style of a Guy Ritchie film. I think that would be great. I would be all for it. I think it's a great idea. I don't think it'll ever happen, but I'm all for it. Count me in if they do it. All right. The next question today comes to us from Ralph Terry, who writes, and I got to start hurrying up here. Um, Hello, AMC Movie Talk, the best show on the web. Thank you so much, Ralph. On a previous episode, you uh, asked who would win an Oscar first, Andy Serkis or Leonardo DiCaprio? Actually, what the question was, Ralph, was what will happen first? Andy Serkis gets an Oscar nomination or Leo DiCaprio wins an Oscar? That was the question we addressed. Anyway, so to use a term that John would like, let's raise the stakes a bit. So it had me wondering, who do you think will win an acting performance Oscar bef- uh, for a lifetime achievement Oscar first? Leonardo DiCaprio or Tom Cruise? Wow. Um... Oh, okay, so who will win a performing actor before they get a Lifetime Achievement? Yeah, because I'm going to tell you right now, Leo DiCaprio and Tom Cruise, both of these guys are des- destined to win uh, or to get uh, honorary Oscars at or near the end of their careers. Um, uh, Leo DiCaprio is putting together just an iconic resume right now. And we often forget about Tom Cruise. But listen to these movies, Tom Cruise. Tom Cruise has represented Hollywood for almost ever. Listen to these films. Endless Love. Remember, this is all one guy. Endless Love. Taps. The Outsiders. Risky Business. All the Right Moves. Uh, Top Gun. The Color of Money. Cocktail. Rain Man. Born on the Fourth of July. Days of Thunder. Far and Away. A Few Good Men. The Firm. Interview with a Vampire. Mission Impossible 1, 2, and 3. And 4. Um, Jerry Maguire. Eyes Wide Shut. Magnolia. Vanilla Sky, Minority Report, The Last Samurai, Collateral, one of his most underrated films, by the way, is Collateral. Um, let's see, I'm going to, the cup, not just a couple months ago, Valkyrie, oh, that might be his most underappreciated film. Valkyrie is an amazing movie. Um, Night and Day, I liked a lot, except for the very end. Um, Jack Reacher was good. Uh, Edge of Tomorrow is awesome. He's got Mission Impossible 5 coming out now. I mean, that is one hell of a resume. That is awesome. Make no mistake about it. By the end of the day, Leonardo DiCaprio, Tom Cruise, both Hall of Famers, both are going to get those Lifetime Achievement Awards. But who do I think is going to actually win an Oscar before the other for acting performance? It's going to be Leonardo DiCaprio. Leonardo DiCaprio is on the cusp. He is he is on the cusp of getting that trophy. And he, considering that he is doing the ridiculous of getting better and better and better, almost every time we see him, Leo adds a new dimension to his ability. Uh, And you got to credit a lot of that to the fact that he works so much with Martin Scorsese, who I'm sure just knows how to bring the best out of him. And he works with great directors like Quentin Tarantino and others. I think think it goes without saying that Leo's going to get his Oscar first. I think he's much closer to an Oscar right now. I think he's turning in Oscar quality performances on a consistent basis more than a Tom Cruise right now. Not that Tom Cruise isn't doing some great work, but... Yeah, Leo DiCaprio is will get one before Tom Cruise gets one. It's it's just inevitable, I feel. But you never know. That's the weird thing about the Oscars, man. It's just that it's it's the hardest award in the world to win, man. So we'll just have to wait and see. But both of them are like Hall of Fame careers. All right, let's move on to the next question today. And the next question today, I believe, is from Shane. Yes, it's from Shane Barlow who writes, Hey, AMC crew, I recently heard that in the new Marvel comics, Sam Wilson, the Falcon will be taking over for Steve Rogers as Captain America. Do you think there is a chance that in Phase 3 or 4 of the Marvel Cinematic Universe that Anthony Mackie's Sam Wilson could become Captain America? Personally, I think it would be great. Thanks for reading my question and keep up the great work. No, I think it's a horrendous, awful, terrible idea. I hate it. And and I hate... I hate that Marvel has done it in their comic books. I hate that they just, you know, got rid of Thor and replaced Thor with some female warrior and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, I had somebody challenge me on this because I got on Twitter. I got on Facebook when Marvel started doing these things with their comic book heroes. The new Iron Man looks absolutely stupid. Um, That the Falcon is actually now Captain America. That Thor is no longer Thor. He's the artist formerly known as Thor. And some female warrior is now Thor. Uh, these are stupid ideas. Now, I had some people in a very friendly way challenge me. So, John, now you've always said 
that you don't mind changing the ethnicity of a character if it's not important to the core of who they are. You've always said you're not really against changing the, the gender of a character if it's, um, if it, as long as it doesn't touch the core of who they are and all that kind of stuff. So why would you have a problem with them making Captain America black? Why do you have a problem with them making Thor a woman? Because it has nothing to do with black or a woman. Like, remember, I was totally cool. I was totally fine. Like way back when, when they took Nick Fury and made him an African-American. But here's the key to that. They just changed his color. That's it. He was still Nick Fury. They just decided to rewrite his background and say, actually, Nick Fury, this character we all know and love, we've changed his background to the point that he's actually of African-American descent. That's cool with me. That's great with me. And I'm going to tell you right now, if Marvel came out and it said in their comic book universe that we are rewriting the history of Steve Rogers and instead of this, you know, scrawny little white kid growing up in the Bronx, it's actually going to be his background is going to be he's going to have been a scrawny little black kid growing up in the Bronx. Um, and if they did that and said Captain America, Steve Rogers is now a black guy, I'd be like, OK, that's different. But sure, let's give it a shot. No problem. Let's see how this works out. That's great. doesn't matter to me. As long as you maintain those core essential elements of who that guy is, make him white, make him black. Doesn't matter to me. That's fine. Um, if you were to do all that. I'd be totally fine with it. My problem is not with black or white or male or female. That ain't my problem with any of this stuff. That has nothing to do with my problem with this stuff. My problem with this is, you know, I mentioned Wayne Gretzky earlier, possibly the greatest hockey player of all time. There's only one Wayne Gretzky. He is Wayne Gretzky. He is the great one. That's who the great one is. It's Wayne Gretzky. When Wayne Gretzky left the NHL, somebody, you know, Sidney Crosby or Marley Mew or somebody else didn't just, or whoever else, didn't just stop calling themselves by their own name and said, from now on, I shall be known as Wayne Gretzky. I am Wayne Gretzky. What, wait a minute. No, you're not. That that dude over there who just retired, that that's Wayne Gretzky. You are not Wayne Gretzky. No, I am now Wayne Gretzky. I'm the Wayne Gretzky now. No, no, you're not. That That's Wayne Gretzky. You're Sidney Crosby. You're Evgeny Malkin. You're whoever else. You're great who you are. Just be you. Don't don't worry about it. No, no, I am Wayne Gretzky. That's what's happening here. You see, to me, Captain America is Steve Rogers. Steve Rogers is Captain America. Captain America isn't a title that was there to be taken and then Steve Rogers went and just claimed the title. Steve Rogers is Captain America. That's who he is. That's who Captain America is. Now, you want to make Steve Rogers white or black or Asian or Indian or Filipino or whatever. I don't care. That's fine. But the core essential element of this kid growing up in the age of World War II, scrawny, wanting to enlist, get volunteers for a super soldier serum program because he's a good man, a good person with a good heart and it transforms him into this brave, the, the, the superhuman Captain America who then falls into a, a thing of ice, is frozen, and now a man out of time. That's Captain America. Now, you want to say he's white or black or whatever else? That's cool. That's fine. I got no problem with that. But to say that, oh, now we're just going to get this guy, and now this guy is Captain America. Oh, so Captain America is no longer a kid, grew up in the World War II era, scrawny, injected super, serum, super soldier serum, went and fought this, did this. Did that. None of that is Captain America more. Now, Joe is Captain America. No, he's Falcon. He's Falcon. Let him be Falcon. And it's just to me, it goes beyond tearing up and ripping up the core essential elements of who Captain America is. Steve Rogers. All the things that make Captain America who he is, that's all now gone. That's gone. I'm sorry. He's not Captain America. Sam Wilson is not Captain America. He's Sam Wilson. And maybe he'll start calling himself Captain America. Maybe he'll put on a costume that looks like the Captain America costume, but he ain't Captain America. He's not. Any more than the Winter Soldier would be Captain America if they made him put on a Star and Stripe outfit and start calling himself Captain America. That doesn't make him Captain America. Steve Rogers is Captain America. You want to mess with the history of Steve Rogers, change up his ethnicity, stuff like that. I'm cool with that. That's great. But don't go and get, you know, Winter Soldier and say, that's Captain America. 
Don't go get, you know, Falcon and say, and just say, oh, now he's Captain America. That's, to me, it's stupid. It's just stupid. Now, do I think that that is going to have implications on the cinematic universe? I actually don't. I think they're going to keep the cinematic universe and the comic books. I mean, they're going to create similarities and and stuff like that to try to one help the other, but nobody's buying comic books anymore. It, it pains me to say that, but very, very few people buy the comics. Um, so I don't, there's no need for them to do that kind of a, a mix up. And I don't think they will. I don't think they will. I could be wrong. I could be totally wrong about that. Um, and maybe that's their plan, but you just asked me, what do I think? My first gut instinct is that they're not going to do that. Uh, but who knows? Anything's possible. They could say Dr. Banner and maybe he finds a cure to the Hulk problem he has. And he's just Dr. Banner now. And he becomes Captain America. That's possible. Anything's possible. Don't discount anything with the Marvel Cinematic Universe. All right, let's go on to the next question today. This is the second last question of the day. And this question comes to us from Joe Vang, who writes, Hello, AMC crew. Uh, what do you guys think of Stephen Chow's work? I really like his movies and would like to see him direct or even be in a North American movie. Thoughts? Uh, well, I've seen a, a couple. I'm not super familiar with Stephen Chow's works. I mean, obviously most familiar with Kung Fu Hustle and Shaolin Soccer. He's got a few other ones too, uh, like a, a pretty decent cop movie as well. Um, Stephen Chow doesn't translate to the North American audience, which is really unfortunate because look, seriously, I know more North Americans and hardly any of us did, but more North Americans saw Kung Fu Hustle than saw Shaolin Soccer, which I think is a crime. I think Shaolin Soccer is just amazing. Shaolin Soccer is so great. And Stephen Chow wrote, directed, and stars in it. Same he did with Kung Fu Hustle. And I know a lot of people that prefer Kung Fu, Kung Fu Hustle over Shaolin Soccer. To me, Shaolin Soccer, though, is the, the, that's the crown jewel of Stephen Chow's work. That's just my opinion. Now, he almost did a North American film. Back in 2009, 2010, 2010, um, uh, it might have been 2010, 2011, Green Hornet with Seth Rogen. Stephen Chow was supposed to direct, that's right, the director of Kung Fu Hustle and the director of Shaolin Soccer. He was supposed to direct Green Hornet and he was supposed to star in it as Kato. And then the infamous creative differences came about and he stepped down as the director. And I think it was Seth Gordon. Uh, it might've been Gordon who stepped in to direct. I, I can't remember off the top of my head. I could look it up, but I'm too lazy. Um, I believe he stepped in to do that. And then Stephen Chow was just going to be Cato. And then not long after that came word, nope, Stephen Chow's not even going to be Cato. So what you had was a Green Hornet movie. That was going to be directed by Stephen Chow and starring Stephen Chow as Cato because Stephen Chow's idol growing up was Bruce Lee. And to him, it was a huge deal to now play the role that made Bruce Lee famous to North American audiences playing Cato. But um, neither came to pass. First, he fell off as the director because of creative differences. Uh, and then he fell off as a, as a cast member. And, you know, all we can do now is lament and think about what might have been because obviously... I got to tell you, I had a lot more fun with Green Hornet than I thought I would. I really did. But, you know, you watch it more and more and you're like, yeah, it's, it's not so good. It's, it's not it's not that good. I don't think it's the terrible pile of crap that a lot of people think it is. And I understand why a lot of people do. I, I actually thought it had some redeeming elements b better than I thought it would be. But even I won't say, hey, that was a really good movie. No, I can't say that. But um, it, it's interesting to think about what might have been had Stephen Chow directed that film. How different would that movie have been? Uh, obviously there would have been more emphasis on Cato and that's fine and that's cool. But, um, but do I think Stephen Chow can break into a North American audience? I, honestly, I don't think he can. I just don't think it translates well. He doesn't need to. He has lots of international success. He's fine. He's great. But, uh, man, I would love it if, uh, if he could break into a North American audience. I just, I just don't see it happening. Not at this point. All right. Now we get to the last question of the day. And the last question today comes from Manny B, who writes, Thanks in advance, crew, if you answer this question. Well, we are answering your question. I'm an avid fan. Thanks so much, Manny. Appreciate that. My question is, with Sony licensing out more of their video game properties for big screen adaptations and Warcraft currently filming. Actually, Warcraft is done filming. But anyway, 
What are those? What are the chances of a Legend of Zelda movie being made? In my opinion, it is the best fantasy game franchise and has possible Lord of the Rings potential. I let's not get ahead of ourselves and say it has Lord of the Rings potential, but you know, I am flabbergasted that there is not a Zelda movie yet. I mean, that's such a huge IP. It's such a recognizable name. And there's a lot you can do with it. And maybe the movie would be crappy. Maybe it would be great. Who knows? But you've got a real potential there for some financial success right off the bat. You announce you're making a Legends of Zelda movie. And instantly, you're going to have a lot of people interested. A lot of people are going to be interested in that. And a lot of people are waiting for that. But this is like a lot of other properties. I feel like every year that goes by, the chances of a Zelda movie are diminishing more and more and more. I, I think they should make one. Take a chance on it. Roll the dice. See what happens. Maybe you can make a really good movie. Maybe it ends up like all other video game movies and ends up sucking. But give it a shot, man. I mean, you're giving a lot of these other ones a shot. Give this one a shot. I, I think it. if I'm the head of a studio, first of all, that studio would probably be bankrupt in six months. But before I drove that studio into the ground, I would roll the dice on Zelda. I totally would. I would love to see a Zelda movie. You know, Link is a great, would be a very adorable hero that I think people would like a lot. I think it's got good potential. It's got the potential to suck, absolutely, but take a chance on it. See what you can do. Because you never know, maybe you can crank out something that's really, really good. And if you do, you make a good Zelda movie, big hit. They're not a billion dollar worldwide club, but big hit. So um, I don't know if they're ever going to do it. I'm flabbergasted that they haven't done it already. I'm scratching my head as to why it hasn't happened. Uh, I think they should. I think it has potential to be a success. I think it has potential to be good at any rate. So we'll just have to see what happens. All right, folks, that'll do it for me for this installment of AMC uh, Mailbag. Once again, don't forget, as I mentioned at the beginning of the show, there will be no mailbag tomorrow. We just got too much we have to do to get ready for uh, for San Diego Comic-Con. Obviously, we've got a lot of stuff coming up there. Make sure you come and join us at Comic-Con. Listen, guys, don't forget, if you want to email us, you can email us anytime. We're going to do mailbags from Comic-Con. So email us your questions to amcmovietalk at gmail.com. Send in those questions. We're going to be doing mailbags. I might even do a little bit of mailbag every single day. I think on top of our regular show, I might do a mailbag every day. Don't hold me to that. Don't hold me to that because I'm, I might be underestimating how busy I'm going to be at Comic-Con. But I'm going to tell you, I'm going to try to do a mailbag every day. So send in questions, send them on in. We're going to do AMC movie talk from there. We're going to do some mailbag from there. Keep sending your questions to us. And listen, don't forget lots of great movies playing in AMC theaters right now. Head on over to www.amctheaters.com for your theater showtime and your movie ticket information. You can even buy your tickets to Guardians of the Galaxy right now, guys. Keep your eyes open for that and keep your eyes open for my interviews with the cast coming up. And thank you guys just again for uh, for watching these shows. It, it's, it's really kind of crazy because I remember... When we were going to start doing mailbags, like, do people really just want to see, you know, do people just want to talk movies enough of just me sitting in front of a screen and, and just talking? And, you know, we thought, hey, if we, I remember me and Dennis, me and Dennis Zen talked about it when we were about to start them. And I said, I don't know, man, I think maybe if we can get four or 5,000 people a weekend watching them, then that'll be worth doing. Well, last weekend, 60,000 people combined, combined between Saturday and Sunday's episode, but 60,000 uh, views of the weekend mailbags. And it's just amazing. Thank you so much guys for your support. And we do this because of you guys. Um, and, uh, we are able to do it because of you and our motivation to doing it is for you. Thank you so much for all you guys do. And for being a part of this and for being a part of the sons of AMC and for being a part of the conversation and adding your input and your, your stuff on all the shows. It's just great to see and great to have. And, uh, I'm really looking forward to meeting as many of you guys down at San Diego as I possibly can. So that'll do it for me guys, for this installment of AMC mailbag. The next time you see my face, will not be a comic con because we still got amc movie talk to do from here in los angeles on monday and tuesday so i will see you again on monday for amc movie talk that's at 11 a.m pacific standard time you can watch us live by coming to our youtube channel so that'll do it for it uh that'll do it for me so thanks a lot for joining me guys my name is john campia for amc movie news and until next time bye bye